DPDR is is actually quite normal. Most people in their life will have an episode of, of DPDR because it, it, to have an episode of DPDR is to be human, that when we're tired, when we're stressed, when we're anxious, when we're fatigued, when we're under the influence, the difference for people who then go on to have the, the despair, it's the catastrophic appraisal, a catastrophic assessment of why they're experiencing that. The weed has done something to my brain. There's countless other kind of stories we can put in there. That is just the difference between why somebody has a transient episode of DPDR and why somebody has a, a chronic episode. Hey everyone, I'm Sean O'Connor, author of the Depersonalization Manual. And today I'm speaking with Paul Molyneux. Paul is a community mental health nurse working in the northwest of England who has been qualified for over 13 years. Paul experienced episodes of DPDR when he was younger, but these were short-lived and not problematic. But when he started training to become a nurse in 2007, he experienced chronic derealization. This lasted for around two years and was an extremely distressing experience. Paul remembers being terrified that he'd be stuck that way forever. But thankfully, in 2009, Paul managed to completely recover. And since then, he's become fascinated by how the disorder manifests itself and is an advocate for the cognitive behavioral model of depersonalization derealization disorder. Paul, you're very welcome to the channel. Thank you for being with us today. It's clear, Sean. Nice to be with you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I'm a nurse um, from kind of northwest of England. I've been kind of qualified for over 13 years now. Um, I live with my uh, partner and her two children so my kind of stepchildren um and yeah so i'm an avid kind of liverpool fan um but now kind of my partner supports blackburn rovers so now i kind of have to support blackburn rovers too your pressure <laughs> peer pressure that's it yeah 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 um so so you've been working in mental health for over, over th 13 years uh, can you tell us a, a bit about your experience with with dp dior paul how did this how did it start for you yeah, sure. So I guess it's kind of a little bit of a kind of a, a longish story, but my initial kind of um, experiences was actually at a very young age. Um, I actually think as far back as I can kind of remember, I experienced transient episodes of kind of derealization. I'm kind of not sure why that is. Um, however, they were kind of short lived. They weren't particularly problematic. I just kind of recall it kind of being an unusual experience that I don't know what to put it down to. Um, I seem to remember even on kind of vividly very hot days, um, these experiences kind of experience more often. Um, so sometimes I find this kind of a little bit uncomfortable. And I kind of grew up with this experience. I, I actually was sort of kind of um, uh, um, looking kind of uh, kind of my background whilst kind of looking into this kind of interview. I kind of I remember going to um, a swimming pool with my mum and my um, my auntie and my cousins um, at a kind of a resort. And I remember having a, an episode of, of, of derealization there. And I actually remember saying to my mum, um, I feel like I could hurt somebody or I could even kill somebody. And it and it wouldn't kind of matter because it just all feels like a, a dream. Um, and I guess that might have been quite distressing for my mum to hear. Um, however, the kind of... DR just kind of drifted off and it kind of didn't become problematic. Um, kind of then kind of fast forwarding, I, I, I guess, um, to uh, 2004, I experienced a traumatic um, event and ended up kind of with a diagnosis of PTSD and had a very brief um, admission to, to hospital as well during that time and managed to achieve a kind of a full recovery from that. And then kind of fast forward again to about, uh, I think it was about kind of 2021, 20, so this would be around about 2006. Um, and I recall being under kind of a lot of stress with kind of relationship issues. Um, I'd moved out of my parents' house. Um, I was looking to start a career as well, you know, looking at doing, starting my training. And during that time, I kind of started to experience kind of what I called at the time kind of deep depersonalization attacks but kind of when I look back now they were kind of clearly panic attacks um and um yeah they were really really distressing I found that kind of experience kind of really 
distressing so I didn't quite kind of know what what these were but there was an intensity of that kind of derealization which I found very uncomfortable and I sort of became fit a little bit fixated on this 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 specific symptom and um, so I guess weirdly I then started to kind of research because I was kind of interested in mental health I then started to kind of research kind of what what this might be and I came across the diagnosis of depersonalization disorder kind of in kind of my, my research um, and I think for a lot of people, they find that really reassuring that there's a diagnosis and that there's a name for this and whatnot. And I think I found it actually the opposite. So I read the word kind of um, with this disorder, people have kind of chronic episodes of, of, of derealization and this can last for a long time potentially. And I actually found that really, really distressing to hear. Um, and then kind of one day... Um, just not long starting my nurse training actually um, I had a, a panic attack or one of these kind of depersonalization attacks and from then on I was stuck with it it's so interesting to for me to speak to somebody who is coming at this from a, 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 an actual mental health um, background and that you trained trained and working in mental health and also the fact that like you would have experienced it kind of going into your, your time learning about mental health. So like you're, it's almost like it's there and now you're kind of starting to learn all of the, the psychology and the like things about like fight or flight response, the, you know, the different, different parts of the brain that trigger, that trigger different things, but you've actually kind of gone through it and had like personal, personal um, experience with it. Um, it's fascinating as well about the, the thing of being uh, when you when you say Paul about like that you found the finding the name depersonalization and like um, and then it kind of it freaking you out because you realize but this can actually be kind of be chronic but it's 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 very interesting that you would have found that in um in the context of like maybe a a, a mental health um, textbook or something. Where or an encyclopedia, maybe. Where, whereas for for most people, and especially kind of now with the with the um, availability of diagnoses on the internet, that people have, they they do that digitally, but they have almost the same experience because they'll read it and they go, oh, that's the thing that I have. But then the next thing is like, oh, but there's there's no definite um, uh, um, time limit on how long you're going to have it which is essentially the same as all anxiety-based conditions. I mean, they're temporary, they're harmless, you can recover right. from them. But when, but when you read, when you read that, like what, like what you want to read, what I wanted to read was, this is going to last for six weeks, Sean, and then, you, and then you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And when I didn't see that, I freaked out and said, oh my God, I'm never going to get better, et cetera. So it's very interesting that you would have had that a, a similar experience, but in the context of like... It Medical Absolutely, medical, yeah. You know. I, I mean, I, and when this this kind of happened to me, I kind of descended into this um, kind of chronic derealization. I mean, I, in a sense, I was kind of lucky because at the time I was able to access kind of the university's journals, the online journals, and PubMed and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I was able to access, and, and there was what I was looking for is what medication do I take to get shut of this symptom. <laughs> Um, or what do I need to do to get shut of the symptom? And it was essentially kind of nothing. Um, so it was actually that word kind of chronic, I found extremely scary. And then also the fact that um, there seemed to be very little in the way of kind of treatment. And both those things were, were terrifying to me. Um, and I suppose also on another level that I was training to be a mental health nurse while I was the one who's meant to be able to kind of help with these kind of issues that other people might be experiencing, but there was uh, there was nothing kind of forthcoming in terms of um, treatment options. It's very interesting as well um, to think about, and, and I, I would um, absolutely de defer to your own um, experience in the in the field of mental health um, in, in, in this regard, Paul, but like like the term the term chronic, as I as I understand it, it's it, it's more of um it it does sound scary and it's it scared the hell out of me when I first saw it, but it does it does tend to be um a, a categorizational term, so it's just like I mean the difference between somebody who has like let's say maybe 
two panic attacks over the course of a month and somebody who experiences like uh, 60 panic attacks over the course of a month. Like the, the, the second instance is somebody who's experiencing panic attacks chronically, but it's it, it, ultimately it's just about the, the, the volume at which you experience it. It's not, it's not a separate disorder. It's not, it's not like, well, there's panic attacks, but you've got chronic yes. panic attacks. So, so that, so panic attacks don't apply to you. You've got this other thing. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think, and I think that especially at first we kind of bypass the logic of that categorization when we see it and we go, Oh God, I've got something that's chronic and that I can't, that I can't get out of. Um, yes. And, and, and which also kind of, um, um, goes to, to goes back to something you said as well, um, Paul, about the, the idea of kind of depersonalization attacks, like, you know, cause I, I would have absolutely felt that back in the day as well. I had an attack of the, I, I was having two, I had two good days, but then something triggered me and I had a massive depersonalization attack. And what I found as I recovered was that like, when, when I looked back at that, at that time in my life, I realized that the, the language that I was using implied that this was out of my control and that I was being attacked by depersonalization and that it was something that kind of would just like hit me out of nowhere, but that I was using this vernacular that implied that I, that, that I uh, ultimately had no control over it. And yes. when I realized that like that what I'm actually describing when I'm saying a depersonalization attack or even a panic attack, but what I'm actually describing is my levels of anxiety going up and the symptoms of that anxiety becoming more acute. And when I understood that, I was able to kind of take a lot of that kind of um, uh, that scaffolding from around the concept and just say, OK, no, this is actually a lot more simple. But it's but it's very interesting, the, the, the language that is used around these conditions that can kind of make people who especially are not familiar with that language jump to scary conclusions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I definitely recall that kind of that kind of wave of dissociation coming over me, derealization coming over me and me thinking, God, what is this? And that being absolutely kind of kind of terrifying and that feeling of loss of control as well. That I think you kind of really experience a lot of kind of anxiety issues, I guess, including kind of panic attack and derealization. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, when you kind of read the kind of clinical literature, it's often quite kind of scientific and matter of fact and not very reassuring to most people who are going through that experience. Kind of it's not really reassuring to read. And it's kind of littered with words like that, kind of kind of chronic, um, which kind of aren't aren't, aren't helpful either. Um, and, and I think the kind of other thing that was utterly terrifying for me so not only kind of was it that i was kind of looking through the literature looking through the textbooks and not finding answers i was kind of going along to my family doctor and kind of him saying well this is just anxiety uh, or going on uh, here's some antidepressants or going along to um you know a counselor and i've uh, counseled kind of being very nice and very kind of thoughtful and listening and whatnot but clearly out of their depth in terms of um you know hearing about these kind of symptoms and that, that being adding to that sense of kind of hopelessness and and kind of that even even doctors can't help me here and um, so how on earth can i get out of this i don't know if you've had this experience as well Paul, and people like you spoke spoken with over the years but i mean the amount of people who i've spoken to who have had that experience and i'm and i'm and i'm one of them um is uh it's mind-boggling you know that people go into their doctor or medical profession and they, they describe the symptoms and the doctor doesn't recognize the symptoms which in itself is a frightening experience and they'll often just describe it or diagnose it as just being anxiety i mean te technically isn't incorrect i guess but yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't give the the patient like the the specificity that they need that kind of that allow that allows them to, as I mentioned earlier, kind of start taking the scaffolding away from what we what we think this is and and and, and what it actually is. But I mean, as as somebody who work, who works in mental health, I mean, how how has it been for you over the last kind of, I mean, not just 13, 15 years, but since this since you first experienced this, as somebody who's been in those corridors and seen like the lack of awareness of us, um, what's what how, how what has your experience been like in that sense? Oh, I've got to, I've got to say it's, it's really interesting actually that that um, I, I think kind of derealization, depersonalization is kind of 
I read somewhere that it's kind of like a third psychiatric symptom. So you you have the kind of anxiety and depression, which are kind of the first two you you'll commonly experience for people. And the third one is kind of dissociation in the form of kind of um, depersonalization, derealization. And I think I was reading kind of, there's a 70% kind of prevalence rate of, of people experiencing these kind of symptoms. Um, however, kind of in my professional life, I've come through, um, come to speak to very few people who have experienced this chronically, which I find really strange. And I kind of wonder why that is. That might be a kind of um, a kind of bias in the patient group that I'm treating. Um, that I treat the more kind of serious end of mental illness, kind of um, kind of schizophrenia and kind of severe bipolar and whatnot. Um, but it may be that kind of the referring individuals underneath me just don't recognise what this is and it gets kind of labelled as kind of, oh, it's just anxiety and depression and they never kind of hit, hit my service. Um, however, I kind of have come across a, a lot of people, a, a heck of lots of people who experience transient episodes of, of derealization and depersonalization. And I think I'm able to provide kind of quite a lot of reassurance to them about kind of what, what this is and to kind of try and keep it kind of transient rather than them becoming very obsessed and um, and focused on the symptom and, and then it kind of turning into something more more chronic. I I, I spoke to um uh, a one of the, the leading researchers um in depersonalization and derealization for um an article I wrote a couple of years ago, one of the, the leading researchers in, in the UK. And I asked him about this. I said, that why, why is it that there's all this like um, evidence to, to suggest that like it is, it's extremely common, um, less common in its chronic, in its chronic form. There's that word again, is that less common in its chronic form, but yeah. it's, but it is extremely, it, it's, it's relatively very common. Um, it's, it's certainly not an unusual thing. So why is it that it's not um, uh, in the same kind of, category of um with diagnosis as something like agoraphobia or claustrophobia or um social anxiety disorder for example and he said he actually immediately he said it's it's very very simple um one of the main reasons is that the symptoms are just very difficult to describe so if you if you're experiencing agoraphobia the symptoms of agoraphobia if you say to your doctor i i, I feel like i can't go outside i feel terrified i'm in crowds of people I can't get on the bus. Um, I, you know, the, I just I can't be outside of my house. Like you know, the 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 symptoms are um, those can be categorized relatively easily, you know, or or at least te- teased out to a diagnosis. Yeah. Whereas with depersonalization, derealization, it's such it's it's such a difficult experience to verbalize properly. Um, because you'll get people say, I mean, I, I remember saying things like, I feel like my memories are fragmented. I actually, I, I said that what I <laughs> to a, a family member, um, uh, people say things like, you know, I feel like I'm, I, I'm in a dream and I can't wake up. I feel like I'm, I'm not here. I feel like the world has gone into 2d. There's, there, there's such a, a vast range of attempts to describe the condition that it's difficult to put that into into a into a diagnosis because it's not and 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 much easier to just say what well, that sounds like anxiety which again is not incorrect but he said that because of that um it uh it is difficult to research it because research tends to need large groups of people and because of that it tends to get mentioned less and less in journals it then which doesn't get into the dsm which then doesn't filter back down to doctors so it becomes this um a, a feedback loop and he said, and the and the other thing he mentioned, which I heartily, heartily agreed with, is he said that very often people who are experiencing depersonalization, derealization, are afraid to describe the symptoms because they think that they're they they'll be told that they're going crazy. And I was absolutely I, I when I I remember talking to my GP back in the day, back in 2005, and I remember thinking like I'm I'm going I'm going into a van. <laughs> and I'm going to be. I'm going to be. I'm the guys are going to come with a straight jacket. That, yeah, yeah. He's he's sitting there going, yeah, 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 and he is he's pressing a button under the table, like you know, yeah. I, I mean, I'm I, I'm I'm cracking jokes about now, but at the time I was I was been terrified. Scared. I yeah. I was scared out of my mind. So he, but he said that there's all these these kind of frustrating inherent aspects to the condition 
that number one, make it difficult to describe, and number two, people are reluctant to describe it, that make it, um, that they kind of generate this feedback loop of, um, of, a, a, of difficulty in researching it and awareness of it. But he also said that that is changing. And 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 I, and I can see it myself, Paul. Like in the in since since I had it back two thousand and five, um, like the awareness of it, even the media has changed. Um, uh, it's not it, it's not unusual for people to to mention it anymore. It's not. I mean, it's not super common. Don't get me wrong, but like yeah. people people are a lot more aware of of the words depersonalization and derealization than they would have been twenty years ago. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, I, I, I mean, just going back to what you're saying about kind of being risking being labelled as kind of mad to anyone who's a GP. You know, it, it is kind of around how we kind of describe it. And um, like, I remember really vividly feeling like I'd lost my soul. You know, and and I I read actually recently that's quite a common thing for people to describe um, because I really felt like I totally lost connection with kind of familiar things that felt very alien to me like I'd go into a room that I was very familiar with and it would just feel kind of dead and like I wasn't really associated with it and I don't think I said that to anybody because um, actually that's kind of a very odd thing to say I knew I wasn't mad you know or or experiencing kind of psychosis I guess um, through my kind of understanding of mental mental illness but I also knew that that would be a very unusual thing to be saying to to any family or or, or professional even. Um, so I definitely think there is some some issues around how we're kind of describing this, and and um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's a, it's a big issue for people. Certainly, and and so much of it I think comes from um, the thing you said about feeling that you've lost your soul i i would have absolutely had that and it's, it's something i come across and i speak to people about this as well but um looking at it from a practical point of view it's like it's it's just it's remember it's important to remember that when you kind of break this down into its logical components and say well so this feeling of disconnection that you have from the world around you and from your activities and from and this, it's everything it's like it's music it's film it's the things that you enjoy doing and the things that kind of give you of of sense of soul like you know or a sense of yeah that connection Connections. connection to the world and to art and to culture and these things that give it that give us joy and when there's a sense when that there's a disconnection there one of the most frightening aspects of it is that is that that disconnection is happening but your rational brain is absolutely intact like there's no there's no like, hallucinations happening um but but you're frantically trying to find an explanation for this so we come up with all sorts of explanations um i mean for me one of one time i was like i'm in a, i'm i i thought i'd at one point i thought I've, i i'm I, di- I i died in a car crash and but i just can't remember it now i'm i'm a ghost or something or or, or and one of them was absolutely i've i've lost my soul somehow so this i cannot connect to these things i can i can i can i can see them and i can hear them but they're at a distance now, and there's this pane of glass between me and them that is that feels both physical and spiritual. And and the most logical explanation for me at the time was, but well, it's your soul, <laughs> you know. But yeah. the, and 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 again, I'm laughing about it now. But I mean, at, but at, but at the time, that that seemed as logical an explanation for what I was experiencing as anything else. And also, if if at that time, Paul, someone had said to me. Sean, what you're experiencing is anxiety. I would have laughed at them if it was possible for me to laugh, like because I would I would have said this is listen, I've I've experienced anxiety. An- anxiety never caused me to have like a panic attack listening to Led Zeppelin. This is this is yeah. anxiety. Like you know, an- yes. anxiety an- anxiety never made me think that I was literally looking at a 2D screen. This is different. This has to be different. Absolutely. This is this is something to do with my soul, with my being. Um and it it wasn't as it turned out, but but that but that that experience is very frightening. Yeah, I think we're looking we look for stories and reasons behind things, don't we? I think, and you know, I wasn't as educated around kind of mental health and and specifically derealization, depersonalization disorder as I am now. So you do look for for reasons behind things, and I think this kind of um, you do see very commonly this kind of 
these kind of existential questions being really big for people with this disorder. And I think, you know, this kind of existential crisis that people kind of go through and, and, and kind of, like you said, I'm a dad, have a lost my soul. And then, and then we start to have those weird questions about kind of what's the nature of reality? What does time mean? You know, what, uh, is there a heaven and a hell? All, all those kind of things. And I think they kind of crop up because we're, we're trying to create a story or trying to figure out or an explanation as to what's happening to us, which is extremely scary and distressing. And, and sadly, we don't come up with an explanation that's, um, that's nice. We tend to come up with a disastrous explanation, a catastrophic explanation. Well, I've lost my soul. That that doesn't sound like a good thing, you know, or or um, yeah. or, or whatever. Yeah. You know, it, and we're not coming up with nice nice things. We're coming up with really catastrophic um, kind of appraisals of that, which then kind of feeds into the um, to the symptoms even more. Um, I I I got um I got quite excited when 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 I got your email, Paul, because I thought I was. It, it's it's not very often that I get to speak to somebody who who developed DP and DR at the same time that I did, which was in the mid the mid two thousands. When yes, I like and as far as I remember, like like YouTube wasn't there. There was no social media. Um, I I, I the only outlet I had was and this was after months of research was like uh, forums, and I would go back to the forums over and over and and, and over again. Um, if Facebook had been there, if YouTube had been there, I would have been, I mean, I was on the computer 24 seven anyway, but I would have been yes. absolutely all, all in with that comparing, contrasting my symptoms, talking about it, catastrophizing it. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, well, I, I, I really, a, I really don't. I really remember that vividly. I think it was there was a forum. I don't know if it's defunct now, but anyway, I, I go on this forum kind of constantly, and I, I read someone describing their symptoms and that they had had it eleven years. And I was kind of like two months into this experience, thinking eleven years. I, I, you know, I, I can't do another month of this. <laughs> Uh, and so, so on, on, I don't know whether it was it was you actually when I downloaded the manual or when it, when I when I uh, got the manual was saying don't go on forums they're the, they're the worst thing to to do and I think especially at that time when there's such little talk of recovery and people getting better it was really just um, an excuse for people to kind of talk about they've had this experience for a very long time and that was an extress, extremely distressing kind of thing to hear. When you're kind of really early on into the um, into your own kind of journey with this uh, with this particular diagnosis, uh, it seems to be very different now. Ish, so Reddit seems to be a big thing. I've been kind of looking at recently, and a large part of that is people actually saying I've recovered, and you know I'm just kind of letting you know that I've got better and that it's possible. Um, and there's a lot of things on YouTube, including yourself, kind of Sean as well, where people are talking about kind of recovery and how they got better. I mean, I think my my broader point is um, around kind of mental illness is we're very good at talking about what's wrong and this is the diagnosis, this is how the diagnosis gets made, you know, these are the symptoms of it, it's very distressing, blah, blah, blah. But we're very, we don't really discuss recovery enough. And I think that is as true for this disorder as it is for every other disorder. We're good at kind of labelling the problem, but we actually should be talking immediately about lots of people get better from this um which which then kind of has a role in the recovery of the individual as well because it's kind of it reduces anxiety and creates a belief that possibly they can get better too um, so that wasn't there unfortunately when, when you and me were going through this there was very little it was all kind of very negative and um very very hopeless what, what, what i found when i developed anxiety in gp and dr was that and we, I think we referred to this briefly earlier, but I wanted, I wanted, I just wanted to know, like, how is this fixable, and what's the quickest way for 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 that to happen? And I didn't really want to hear anything else. And I think that, like, so so much of that opinion, because it's it, it's not unfounded, because like with the vast majority of conditions, I mean, more. Or physical conditions and ailments that one can develop over the course of their lives, 
you go to a hospital, you speak to a doctor and the doctor says, here's what you do. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. Worst case scenario, they have to look up something and they go, okay, here's what you do. Here's what you do. But there's a plan of action. There's a, um, there's a time frame. There's a definite time frame involved. And the, and for the patient, there's a sense of kind of taking that responsibility and setting it aside and being like, okay, now I'm in the hands of the NHS or now I'm in the hands of the professional. Of, yeah. of, of, the, of the professional. Exactly. Whereas with the PDR and I, and I think like that when you don't get an answer immediately, that it has the, the, the specificity that you want, you just keep looking and you just keep looking. And then that ends up being social media and rooms and comparing and contrasting symptoms, constantly talking about it, constantly asking questions. Whereas um, my understanding is that in, in cognitive behavioral therapy, that a strong part of that is, kind of, is saying, okay, well, you need to, once you understand what the condition is, you kind of have to let it go to some degree. And there's a sense of acceptance in it and, and, and starting to kind of reframe your thoughts and refocus your attention away from it, which at the start can, again, based on everything that you may have been through in, in, in with medicine and medical professionals in the past, you're kind of going, what, 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 what are you talking about? Like, you know, just put, where, where's the plan? Um, so yep. it can feel very, it can feel very counterintuitive to come at it from that, to, from, 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 from that angle. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to hear your experience. Yeah, I, I, I think kind of what I recall. So I, I descended into this situation just at the start of my nurse training. So it's a three year course here. And part of that is obviously assignments and, 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 um, Elections and whatnot, and a large part of it is actually working on placement. Uh, so you'll go to hospitals. You will effectively be a nurse on the ward, you know, a student nurse on the ward, um, kind of, kind of working. Um, and I vividly remember being on the wards with very sick patients, people with kind of schizophrenia and having kind of um, uh, psychotic episodes, etc. Um, thinking, I, I really wish. I was you guys, and I feel dreadful saying that now because these are really horrendous illnesses people experience. Um, the reason I thought that was because at the very least, the psychiatric profession pretends to know what we're doing with with kind of schizophrenia and, and, and kind of severe bipolar, or at least it, it, it has a very good idea of what to do. And a lot of these patients kind of lost insight. So it, it is around kind of psychiatry kind of doing something to them so they've lost insight they don't know what's going on they don't know they're unwell psychiatry is going to kind of t take over we're going to kind of detain these patients and we're going to kind of treat them with medication or whatever um th this was this was very different like you say i think um yeah with a lot of anxiety-based disorders and disorders like this i think there's a a, a large I guess responsibility might be the, the wrong word, but there's um, a large focus on the service user, so you as an individual kind of taking some ownership in your own recovery, um, which isn't the case for kind of other psychiatric disorders, um, the ones that I'm kind of mentioning where people are kind of acutely unwell. But but actually, I think through to the entirety of kind of um, m mental Ill, Ill health, I, I don't think anyone gets kind of um, better in inverted commas without some element of them taking some re responsibility for um, for their own recovery. Uh, I think you mentioned Paul about like wish wishing that you had something else. Um, I mean, I I remember like thinking I've heard I've th this is actually a very very common thing. You'll hear people saying like I, I, I wish it was cancer. Like I wish I I wish I had something. Like cancer, because at least with cancer, I go to a hospital. As a, as I said earlier, there's a there's a definite plan. The, the the outlook might it mightn't even be great, but at least there's an outlook. Yeah. At least yeah, at least I'm at, at least I'm not like staring down the barrel of like sixty years with this thing that I have no idea what, how to fix it. I have no idea what's wrong, and it's and it's crippling me every single every minute of, of every day. At le at least with with something like cancer, there is a there's the, there's a there's a plan of action and there's a support system for it. Absolutely. And but what's really interesting is that I I remember like I remember thinking that, 
But I also remember thinking, like, I wish I had, I wish I had claustrophobia. Like, I remember thinking of all of the anxiety-based conditions I could have gotten, I get DPDR, which is just like absolutely brutal. It's just constant disconnection, existential thoughts, affecting your vision, your memory, can't enjoy anything. And I remember, I remember thinking, like, wh- why couldn't I have gotten like claustrophobia or agoraphobia? You know, why couldn't I, yeah. I'm so un- yeah. un- unlucky? You know, because and I remember thinking, well, for somebody with claustrophobia, like their day is fine until they have to get into the elevator. And then, then that five minutes is tough, but then the rest of the day is fine again. And of course, yeah, like for this somebody- This is chronic, with, this, is, this is- Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. For, for somebody it's unremitting, with, with, yeah. Yeah, for somebody with chronic, chronic claustrophobia, they wake up in the morning and it's the first thing they think about. And they're trying to plan how, how do they avoid these situations throughout the day? Is it going to get worse? Is it better than it was two days ago? What happens if the elevator breaks down? What happens if a bomb goes off in the subway? What if, what if, what if? So constant catastrophic thinking. And and, and also probably somebody with claustrophobia is thinking, geez, that DPDR doesn't sound too bad, <laughs> you know? Because at least someone with DPDR can get into an elevator. At least they can go Absolutely, to work, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It does that, there's a major think, uh, uh, green, greener grass <laughs> aspect to all Absolutely, of it. yeah. I think we, we struggle, yeah, the grass is always green. I think we struggle to put... Um, uh, ourselves in other people's shoes at times you know we, ju- we just want out of what we're experiencing um es- essentially and kind of going back as well to the kind of the kind of s- scouring the internet for kind of answers and kind of not not get anywhere the kind of the, the cognitive behavioral model they talk about kind of what what maintains this disorder um so, so there's things that you might there's a reason why you might experience the the symptoms and the reason why this might have been set up to be something that you experience persistently um but but there's things that kind of maintain the disorder as well and i think kind of cr- constantly seeking kind of reassurance on the internet or constantly trying to seek kind of answers from the internet and not getting anywhere kind of that's going to just create more anxiety which is then going to create more dissociation more derealization which is then going to create more, um, more distress. Um, so I, I think one of the kind of maintaining factors that I think I was engaging in was was trying to scour the internet and and trying to find answers and um, and obviously not getting anywhere that increases anxiety, which then increases the the DPDR. Um, yeah, it, it just it just simply isn't the the disorder where there is a very simple answer, and that's. Um, uh, that's that can be really kind of distressing for people because it's often not what we want to hear. Like you said, the I guess the medical professional is very much um, medical profession, sorry, very much sometimes puts the idea into people's head that there are qu- kind of quick fixes. You just kind of take this medication, you just have this treatment, and then you're kind of out. And that just simply isn't the case with this this disorder at all. Um, sorry, a bigger, uh, were you training or working at this point when you had uh, after you well, developed the condition? Yeah. So essentially, I started my training, and I realise now that um, one of the reasons why I developed the disorder was because I was under a lot of stress. Because this is something I was gearing up to. This is my career. This is you know something I really wanted to do. Uh, and then I started my training, and after a month or so of being on this training, and you know having to kind of fit in and do assignments that you've not done before, and and, and learn new things, and then I had this kind of panic attack, which then triggered this kind of permanent kind of dissociation. So um, yeah, I was on I was on the training, and the training kind of lasted for, for three years. And kind of what I, what I realise now is that it's possibly one of the reasons of why I, this became. Um, DPDR kind of chronically um, was because I was under that immense pressure of of, uh, of starting university, the immense pressure as well of having not long moved out of the family home, the immense pressure of going through kind of relationship issues and and, and those kind of things. And I, I think kind of I was clearly predisposed to experiencing dissociation because I recall that from a very young age. Um, but that kind of environment, that's highly stressful environment that I was in at that, that time, that then created the um, the environments in which this became problematic. Um, so it's an extremely stressful environment, kind of created the um, the circumstances in which this became a kind of a more like kind of distressing and longer term condition. 
but you but but you 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 stuck at it did so so how how did you kind of like uh, like on days where you were you were feeling particularly anxious and depersonalized or do you, do you realize Paul like what did you just kind of push through it or did you have kind of coping mechanisms to 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 rely on I it, I drilled through it one uh, late father kind of taught as children was that you you just you work and work's a good thing and you kind of carry on and I I kind of pu- pushed through it and I, I naturally it was horrendous it was absolutely awful um you know like I said feeling like I'm going on these mental health wards wishing I was the, the patient to me feeling like re- really possibly I can't, shouldn't be here the, the the other thing as well is that there's kind of um having to act like you're not unwell yourself whilst also speaking to very unwell people takes an immense amount of psychological energy um and it's also actually something that the the cognitive behavioral model kind of points out is a is it can be a problem is is it trying to act normal is in a sense quite dis- dissociating um, trying to act a certain way is is kind of it is depersonalizing and um, so the kind of stress and strain of, of of kind of being on this course and having to do the placements and the essays was kind of creating this environment where the dpdr became kind of kind of permanent i guess or felt like it was permanent and um, but also then the kind of having to pretend that i am normal and not letting on to people and pretending that I'm just this normal guy whose whose mental health is absolutely fine, kind of possibly further added to the depersonalization by acting and pretending to be normal. So there's another kind of maintenance, uh, another maintenance factor for why this possibly persisted for me. Yeah, I would have had a very similar experience. Um, I mean, this, when DP and DR and anxiety first happen, and you don't understand what they are, and these symptoms hit you like a train but your life around you is appears to be continuing as normal that can be very very stressful um you know socialize trying to work just hang out with people but at the back of your mind you're you fundamentally do not understand what this condition is or why these terrifying symptoms are happening um going to work you're um hanging out with friends and family and at the back of mind you're think at the back of your mind you're thinking um, what if I'm going crazy? If I've damaged my brain with drugs, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that can be incredibly stressful because you might be thinking that at any time, like something terrible could happen. Like you might hurt yourself, you could you might start hallucinating, et cetera, et cetera. All based on not understanding what the condition is. So in that context, trying to act normal is is extremely difficult. Um, one of the main tenets of recovery um from any anxiety-based condition is understanding and internalizing what the condition actually is and why it happened, why it's harmless and why you ultimately don't need to be afraid of it. Um, Once you have understood and internalized that, then starting to get back to normal is actually starting to get back to normal. Um, Because again, with any anxiety-based condition, you can't really let go of that condition and focus away from it until you have properly understood it. And at that stage, getting back to normal is actually a vital part of recovery. Um, did uh, did people notice, Paul? Um, did people ever actually like take you aside and say that you're say that they're concerned about you? No, I I <laughs> I, I, I was very very lucky. I had a a wonderful friend uh, who I met kind of whilst I was on this course because she moved into the house um, I was living in. And she was uh, she was trained to be a clinical psychologist. So it so happens, and she 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 works now as a clinical psychologist. And she was really the only one who I felt kind of vaguely kind of understood what I might be going through. And um, but certainly on on the course, I never told anyone. Never told my kind of mentors or tutors or or, or friends. So there's that kind of the almost the entirety of my life experiencing this really horrendous symptom, but having to pretend that I was normal. Um, was just absolutely exhausting, and I, I really kind of see now is that that kind of um, that anxiety of of being on the course, and then the anxiety of having to pretend to be normal, just created more opportunities for the DPDR to kind of rear its head. You know, it kind of fed into that cycle of kind of derealization, making you anxious, which then creates more kind of derealization, and then kind of that maintenance thing of then having to pretend that you're normal 
is depersonalizing depersonalizing it, it, it itself so then creates more kind of depersonalization so I was, I was stuck in a lot of these kind of loops the other big loop i was really stuck in which is another maintenance factor was was constantly checking how i was feeling so the first thing i'd do even before i kind of woke up was or it just before i got open my eyes sorry would be well how how's today going to feel how how's my dpdr today the, the first thought that come into my head open my eyes oh it's it's still there isn't it um so that was kind of another maintenance thing that i, re- I recognized i was doing now that kind of obsessional kind of um components of the disorder was kind of really kind of um, embedded in me that kind of constant symptom checking um and then the, the thing about it is is that if you 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 find it um and not only will you find it but sometimes you'd be looking so hard for something that you might get some kind of um false false positives or false alarms i guess where you might not be experiencing it but you might get something that's like it like you might be feeling tired or something but then you attribute that to your dpdr um uh, so I was again looking back. I kind of really kind of fit into the cognitive behavioural model of, of of how the disorder is kind of maintained with this kind of constant symptom checking, um, which I think probably a lot of your the people you speak to probably experience as well. I always find that there's an interesting comparison to be made with uh, tinnitus. Um, I'm I've always been kind of fascinated by it, and um, also one of my sisters used to work for a company who develop um devices to help people suffering with tinnitus um and i worked as a musician for years and years as well so it was a major part of kind of you know i've been extremely careful with my hearing but um one of the most fascinating and frustrating aspects about tinnitus is that people <clears throat> can become so hyper aware of and on the lookout for internal sounds they will start to perceive normal internal sounds as being tinnitus. So like you'll hear like the normal kind of um, the normal kind of tones that you would hear in a room or you would hear like um, like the like the the blood pulsing in your in your ear vessels, for example. And you but you're immediately oh that's that's tinnitus like, you know, and these are things that um, you would if your attention is focused away from them, like they're still they're at the exact same volume. But you're not focusing on them, so essentially they do, they, they they don't exist. Like it's the kind of the the, the power of focus, you know. Yeah. And the and the thing you mentioned as well, Paul, about like waking up in the morning and like it being the first thing. I I actually I remember like waking up in the mornings, and I'd have like maybe five seconds of normality before, and then and then I'd remember. Oh no, you're supposed to have this thing. Yeah, so like, that's and, right. yeah, right. And then I check it, and of course. And of course, when you check it over and over again, it's it's there. Like so, then you're oh, how am I going to get myself out of bed? But yeah. one thing that I, I I noticed as I recovered was that the way I had thought about the condition was that was I I considered it in binary terms. So when I when I woke up in the morning, what I was checking to see was is it still there or is it gone? So is that switch on or is it off? And of course, yes. it and, and of course, like it's it's not a binary. Um, condition of course like it's a anxiety is a spectrum like it changes it goes up and down it changes over time um and thinking about it in bi- in binary terms almost kind of locks you into a, a, a binary checking process whereas when you start to let that 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 type of thinking go and you say well it's actually um uh, uh it's a spectrum it's a process then you can say okay well it's it, it's there but i've i've loads of stuff to do so just, you, you just get up out of bed and you start either to shower, take the dog for a walk, or whatever. And in doing so, you've 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 now avoided spending twenty minutes lying in bed, freaking yourself out, checking to see how the degree to which it is there out of out of ten. And you've now focused away from it in the same way that you're that focusing away from some of the tinnitus can help to, re, you know, reduce the, the the awareness of this the, the, the sensation of it. But it was a major thing for me was n- not thinking of this like it was a light switch that had been flicked in my brain and that I was trying to kick it down every day, every yeah. morning, like, yeah. you know, and, and then getting pissed off when, when it wasn't every, every, you know, when it hadn't been switched off in the mornings, like, you know, and, yeah. and allowing that and allowing that to ruin my day. Like, you know, absolutely. And and again, that's, that's, you know, not to, oh, that's this cognitive behavior model kind of too much, but that's one of the key 
treatment suggestions is around kind of diary keeping to to because this isn't although i was like you was experiencing it constantly there was variability in it and and if there if there is variability in it then i would suggest that that suggests that this can go and um, this doesn't have to be kind of permanently severe so if it, if it if it if it sometimes it's kind of an eight out of ten and other times it's a six out of ten well that kind of proves that this is not fixed we're not dealing with kind of i don't know a, a, a lost limb which is always a lost limb um the the other thing about um the kind of t- tinnitus example which i think is kind of really good is that this idea of kind of false alarms so um you know like you're saying you might hear s- something that maybe sounds like tinnitus and then you attribute that to to tinnitus and the kind of analogy that i kind of heard around this was um around like if if in your area now you heard that a, a, a puma was on the loose had been kind of um released from a zoo accidentally um and it, then you kind of were walking about the street and you saw the neighbor's black cat, then you might think, oh, well, that's the puma. That's, this is the puma, isn't it? Because you, you're on the lookout for a puma. Um, whereas if it would have been any other day, you would have just said, well, that's my neighbor's black cat. And it very much the same with this kind of condition. Like I said, my, my, um, my initial solution to kind of trying to deal with this problem was to try and sleep my way to my way out of it so when i first became kind of unwell with this i went to bed basically and slept kind of very strange hours you know maybe going to bed at two in the afternoon Um, and of course what happens when you sleep for a few hours you get kind of sleep inertia and you feel very groggy and very weird when you wake up which is entirely kind of natural is that your kind of brain chemicals kind of adjust to being um being awake and then i would wake up and of course that would make me feel dissociated and that's a false alarm um because actually what i'm experiencing is entirely normal i'm meant to feel kind of a bit strange and a bit weird when i wake up and i certainly will will be feeling a bit strange and a bit weird when i'm sleeping very unusual hours um so there's there's kind of loads of these kind of false alarms that people can can kind of experience and i know for yourself your i think strategy was to drink was to, i guess to wake yourself up out of this by drinking lots of coffee um which kind of felt like you know it's like the same as me trying to sleep my way out of it you know looking back now it seems really really silly but you will have probably experienced more anxiety as a result of drinking more coffee um which will have naturally created possible dissociative symptoms um but i think that's probably quite natural to experience those dissociative, dissociative symptoms but that's a false alarm isn't it that you'll have then attributed that i oh, know this is my dpdr it's coming on it's really bad um, Absolutely. And it's, you know, if like if you if you fly to Australia and you and you don't sleep for like two days or two and a half days or something, if you experience the symptoms of dissociation, then you you wouldn't give them you wouldn't even give the time of day, you're just like, oh, yeah, but that's that's part of it. But if you experience yeah. those symptoms of dissociation, like you know, when you're trying to pay attention to a lecture and you haven't been on a plane, then you're like, oh my god, something is wrong, something is terribly, terribly wrong. Um, and absolutely about the um, the uh, really interesting what you say, Paul, about like um, you know trying to fix it with with sleep, you know, and um, and I think as well because because the because it feels like I remember distinctly thinking like I feel like I'm in, I'm in a dream and I can't wake up. So in my head, I was thinking, well, this maybe this has something to do with like maybe I didn't sleep properly. Maybe I like all oh, these explanations, like maybe I wasn't able to access like REM sleep for, for some for some reason. So yes. the best thing I can do is maybe try to sleep more. But then it's, when, it's, when, it's, when you sleep more, like if you're not up at a reasonable hour, like you, you feel more tired during the day and then you try to wake yourself up with coffee. And as you said, the, the sleep inertia. Um, and it just creates this, this, <coughs> this drama of like attempted explanations for what it is all and all the time, the anxiety is getting worse. And, uh, you know, you're throwing caffeine into the, in, into the mix, like, you know, um, but I guess like what the, it's changed like since, since we had a Paul and what is hopefully continuing to, to change is that the distance between 
So when somebody gets this, when somebody develops anxiety in GP and DR, the distance between them ha- de- developing it and finding out what it is, and just like, because even if you just say, okay, well, this is an anxiety-based condition, um, it's got nothing to do with sleep, like, you know, so don't, don't worry about that. Just even finding that out, you say, okay, so I don't need to worry about sleep. I don't need to worry that this is like my, that my REM state is damaged. I don't need to hammer into coffee to try and fix this. Yeah, absolutely. But it's like, yeah. but it's like, but it's like if the, the dis- that distance is hopefully getting shorter and shorter over time. Um, and hopefully it will get to the point soon where it, 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 it is, it's that same, the same distance as agoraphobia or claustrophobia, where it's okay, it's not, it's not pleasant, um, but you, the amount of time that you need to spend kind of lost in the woods with it and trying to just figure out this and figure out that um, is getting, is getting small, smaller and smaller. And yeah. but how, is, that, is, is that your ex- experience? Because I, I mean, listen, all, all of my experiences, it's anecdotal. It's based on speaking to like, I mean, like thousands of people over the years, like, but for, uh, from your perspective as somebody who's actually operating in, in the medical community, is that, is that something that you, that, that you think is happening? I, I don't know. I, I think there's really good um, kind of professionals out there, kind of, kind of services like you kind of yourself. And there's a charity in the UK called Unreal who've recently kind of been, been set up as well. And I think they're having kind of, um, media campaigns and whatnot um but i i certainly don't i think even in terms of the professionals i work alongside i don't think this is a recognized enough condition at all and sadly that allows as a vacuum isn't there so you experience this gpdr and uh, you don't know what it is so you insert your own narrative into this and it's always a catastrophic narrative or it, it can be a catastrophic narrative and that just that then creates the disorder because that creates anxiety which um which then creates more dpdr which creates more catastrophic th- thinking which creates more anxiety which creates more dpdr so that's the cycle that people are in so the the, the thing that i kind of um inserted into my story was i've done something to my brain like one of my systems is out here and this is this is kind of permanent so that was my kind of narrative that i that i stuck in into the vacuum of kind of um uh, the lacking of kind of knowledge out there or lacking of professional direction i guess um, and like you said i, I think the, the short we, we can get that time uh, between kind of um, somebody experiencing this or this, this um, kind of disorder and somebody kind of getting actual kind of professional help or a professional explanation, I think that is probably the key in lessening the kind of um, length of time that people experience this, that, that change of narrative. And a, a big part of that is just to say that kind of DPDR is, is actually quite normal, um, is that most people in their life will have an episode of, of DPDR because it, it, to have an episode of DPDR is to be human, that when we're tired, when we're stressed, when we're anxious, when we're fatigued, when we're under the influence, we are liable to have those experiences. The difference for people who then go on to have the, the disorder, it's the catastrophic appraisal, a catastrophic assessment of why they're experiencing that. So... I don't know. The weed has done something to my brain, or I, I, you know, I don't. There's countless other kind of stories we can put in there. Um, th- th- that is the, that is just the difference between why somebody has a transient episode of DPDR and why somebody has a, a chronic episode or a chronic period of this. It's, it's the appraisal. It's how the um, it's how they appraise what they're experiencing. Like I said, for me, the big one was I've, I've definitely done something wrong with my brain and there's no going back here. And that just feeds into the anxiety, which then feeds into the DPDR. It's just a whirlpool that just like drags in, oh, you, it, was, it was weed, it was you've damaged your brain, it's this, it's that. And it's, it's a, without proper information and someone just explaining to you what's going on, it's very, very difficult to extract yourself from that whirlpool and start and to look at it from some sort of objective point of view because oh, you're back in the whirlpool. Absolutely, you're back yeah. in it, you know. 
the, um, I think the, the other big thing then is, we, we, so we set up that narrative that this is something catastrophic, so this is something to our brain. And then so sadly that sets up the cycle of DPDR for the, that creates anxiety, which creates more DPDR, which creates more catastrophic thinking. But then the, the additional factor then is that we, um, we do things that we think might be helpful but which actually aren't so like symptom you know constantly checking how you're feeling you know trying to sleep it off trying to you know have um, uh, drink lots of coffee to wake yourself up out of it and um, trying to act normally av- avoiding situations which might trigger dpdr and um, th- this is that, that kind of maintenance cycle so all these things we think are helping but actually are just promoting the disorder so so the the, I guess recovery kind of might happen when we might be able to change how we think about the disorder, so or about the symptom. So this isn't anything to do with my brain. My brain's exactly the same as it was. You know, the weed hasn't changed my brain. This is just a normal human experience to be to have them um, DPDR. But then recovery also will happen, or should happen, or might happen when we change those maintenance um, factors as well. And, you know, the constant symptom checking as well, to try and avoid engaging in, the, in those kind of behaviours. Um, you know, don't don't sleep it off, don't drink lots of coffee. So I, I guess for your kind of viewers out there, it's kind of um, to kind of look at what is, how am I thinking about this disorder or about this experience? But is there anything I'm doing which might actually be kind of promoting or maintaining this cycle? I mean, and it's often those things we think are helpful, but but sometimes kind of aren't. Uh, when we can really look into it. So, Paul, um, in terms of your own recovery, how did, how did that start? Was it a change in kind of how you thought about it, or was it a change in your in your work situation, or did you just get used to it, or what? What, what was the what was the change? How did it start? So, yeah, yeah. So, I essentially had this for getting on kind of eight months, two, two two years. So, kind of around about kind of Christmas uh, twenty oh eight. I was kind of in a really in a really bad way. I, I, I literally didn't know what to do, um, and I actually thought, "I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go to A and E and see what happens," and not kind of expecting much. Um, and actually, I, I spoke with a, pr- a practitioner from the the kind of crisis team there, who was happened to be a psychologist and who was actually very understanding and kind of um, seemed to vaguely know what I might be experiencing. Um, Nothing was really done from that other than that I was given, I think, five milligrams of diazepam and kind of sent on the way. Um, now, kind of unbeknownst to me, what he, what he did was, uh, he because I told him what I was doing, he contacted the uni and obviously said, Paul's turned up at any last night, you know, I think you need to know about this. And then the next day I woke up and my tutor rang me up and said, right, you, you're going off the course, you're having a break for as long as you need. Um, and kind of j- during that time, um, my my friend who I mentioned earlier, the clinical psychologist, she kind of dragged me along to kind of um, the gym, effectively. So she took me along to kind of spinning classes and um, circuit training. And something really strange happened. So um, the spinning classes and the circuit training were in incredibly engaging experiences. So I, I vividly recall the spinning classes were kind of lights going and the, it was dark room. It was loud music. It was the, um, the, the 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 facilitator kind of shouting at you to go harder. It was the the kind of focus on the bike and the change of the gears and the being out of breath. And just during that period, I kind of noticed that I wasn't dissociating. So for the for the 45 minutes that I was going uh, going through this kind of spinning lesson, I kind of wasn't dissociating. And as soon as I re- realised this wasn't permanent, then I describe it as the spell was broken at that point. So the, 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 it just, um, yeah, I, I, because I really because my big fear was that this was my brain's changed, and this is this is how I'm going to be now for the rest of our, my life. As soon as I recognised it, it, it wasn't. Even if it was just forty-five minutes, then I realised actually that this 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 can be beaten. And so I kind of continued to exercise, and I ended up kind of going to the gym. I think every, every day by that point, and it, it, eventually this kind of just kind of dissipated over over I guess the course of a, of a few months. 
Um, and, and since then, my kind of my story around my own recovery has been kind of well. The reason I got better was because I engaged in lots of sport, and it must be sport that was that was kind of um, making this go away, basically. And there may be some truth in that because lots of evidence around kind of exercise and sport being kind of really really helpful. And I, and I actually think it was such an engaging activity that. Um, that it really kind of did drag me out of myself um, and out of that kind of um, symptom monitoring that I think when you're exercising, that um, if you exercise kind of hard enough, you can't think past your next breath, let alone think about how you're kind of feeling. But actually when I kind of look back, there was a there was a, a, a bigger thing to my recovery or in part a bigger thing to my recovery was that I actually, my life stopped for a period. So the, the psychologist who rang uni did me a real favour because I think without him doing that, I wouldn't have then, I wouldn't have been asked to to kind of stop the course for a period. And during that time where I was off uni for, a, I think, about two months, um, I was just able to kind of chill out. I wasn't having to pretend to be normal. I wasn't having to write essays. I wasn't having to turn up to placement. You know, I could just totally focus on just myself and just and just kind of chilling out and just being myself and focus on my recovery. So I think whilst the kind of the gym and the exercise created um, this situation in which I realised the DP wasn't permanent and that then reduced my anxiety levels, I think the fact that I was off uni and in that environment of not being at uni and being able to chill out, chill out created this environment in which my stress levels just massively reduced. And we obviously know that kind of stress is a big factor about we, why people can experience kind of DPDR. So those, are those two factors that I look back now and then um, I, I think they were the big things in terms of my recovery. Really interesting about the, the the gym, the gym aspect of it as well. And that was something, definitely something that specifically happened. Weirdly enough, actually, it was a, fr- a friend of mine saw that I wasn't working, that I wasn't really socializing much anymore. And I, I also lost like, crazy amount of weight and stuff and I wasn't eating properly and sleep properly. anyways my body just said look come down to the gym and I'd never been to the gym in my life never no interest in the gym no interest in sports and uh he said no we're going to the gym so off we went down to the gym and in my head I'm thinking like well, I'm going into a large room with people mirrors fluorescent lights <laughs> you know I mean I'm not going to be in here for like, I'm going to freak out, you know? Anyways, I went, went in and just kind of like I did, I did a very, very light at the beginning, 10 minutes, then 20 minutes. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, it just increased and increased. I mean, I was, I was never like bodybuilding or anything, but like I was, I would always go in and I, and I'd come away tired. And I think that was a huge thing for me was because like that routine is like the opposite of the sleep inertia, coffee, dreaming, um, worry, worrying about that thing. It's the opposite of it because it's, first of all, it gives you a routine in the evenings. Um, you're tired afterwards, so your sleep improves. Um, exercise releases endorphins. There's a sense of accomplishment afterwards, and you're just getting out of the house, like, you know. And, and also, of course, like, you have to socialize a bit in the gym. I mean, you can keep... The headphones on but you you're going to talk to, to to the girl at the counter you're going to chat to someone doing weights inside or whatever um and i think for me as well there was something about that that said like you sean you have all of these rules built up for what you can and can't do but now you're you've just broken all of them and you actually feel a bit better and you're actually sleeping a bit better too and oh my and, and isn't isn't this lovely and i think it just it's um as you I, I mean what what better way to describe it than um the spell has been broken? It's just like this okay the, this this monolithic thing that has been just like sitting on top of me for the last two years and now it's I know okay it's not it's not as scary as I thought I can I can reduce this by sitting on a bike throw, throwing on a nineties dance mix <laughs> you know absolutely and just. I can feel a bit better. I can reduce this by fifteen percent. Yeah, 
And then you better. believe. And, and, and yeah, believe. absolutely. It changes. The, the narrative's changed. Absolutely. That this is no longer permanent. This, this can't be something to do with my brain or, or in the sense that I thought it was because, well, it's gone for 45 minutes. I actually, I think exercise is a particularly good way to achieve that. And um, because of all the other benefits that come with kind of exercise, you know, for your physical and mental health. But I don't necessarily think it has to be exercise. I think it just has to be something that you're interested in enough that's going to completely engage you to drag you away from this tendency to symptom check. So there's no way whilst I was sat on a bike sweating and the dance music going and the trainer training at me, there was no way that I could think, what's my DPR? What's my DPDR like now? I was just focused on breathing. I was just focused on staying upright on the bike. Um, so I think exercise can be kind of a, a good vehicle for that. I don't think it has to be. I think for somebody else, it might be knitting with friends, you know, or joining a certain group or, or something like that. But it has to kind of be something that kind of drags you outside of yourself enough so that you're not constantly symptom checking. Okay. And so then, Paul, did, so did you... Did the anxiety then kind of just start to reduce slowly after that? And then, and also, at what point did you did you get back to work? And did you feel that you were prepared to do that? Um, so about, I think I was off for about two two months. Um, so it kind of wasn't a, an incredibly long time. Um, and by that point, the the DPDR I, I realized kind of wasn't permanent. But but I think um, this isn't to say that. Um, I don't experience kind of dissociation now. I do. And that's actually fine because I'm a human being and I can dissociate from time to time. So I think that was the other kind of realisation that I needed to have because there were several episodes after that two years where I had depersonalization and I was terrified that it was going to come back permanently um, or terrified it was a sign of, of me kind of deteriorating. Um, so I think there's kind of almost like a two-stage process to recovery. There's the first stage where you kind of realise that you're getting better and that you can do this. Um, but actually, I think the experience of kind of mental illness itself can be kind of really traumatic for people. And I think once you've recovered and you realise you're, you're kind of better, you're then terrified that you might go back again. But then that creates the environment in which you can then experience more kind of DPDR. Like, so you're, you're on the lookout again for... Uh, is it coming back and um, so i think um it, it took me a few years to realize that it kind of well not that it wasn't coming back but it was just a few years for me to accept that i can experience dpdr and that that's absolutely fine it's it's how i assess it so i will often oftentimes now i'll experience dpdr when, when i'm stressed or when i'm tired so usually at work at around about three or four o'clock in the afternoon and the lights are a certain hue um, that I can experience DPDR. And I will just say to myself, I'm tired. It's coming towards the end of the day. The lights are just a bit funny. Um, and I don't kind of catastrophize about it. Um, whereas even after I kind of recovered, my, my kind of um, the initial stage of my recovery, I will, if I'd experienced that symptom, I might say to myself, oh, oh God, this, this, this might be a bad sign and it's coming back. Um, Whereas, whereas now, like I said, I, I experience DPDR kind of reasonably frequently because I get tired and because I get stressed and because I might drink a few too many beers or whatever, you know, and I'm able to number the narrative I now put in was um, I'm just drunk or I'm just tired or I'm just a bit overwhelmed. And then that takes a sting out of it. And once that situation ends, so once I'm no longer fatigued or no longer stressed or no longer drunk, the DPR, DPDR just goes. Um, so it, it, yeah, so it's 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 changing that narrative that has sustained the recovery for me. And so I've been kind of well now for you know well over a decade. Um yeah, and that's really interesting as well. That was a, a major part of when I was recovering because I I did I did have a couple of I had a couple of periods like in the time when I had things like DPDR when I was re I was I started to see reductions in the anxiety, but it, it it was it was almost because I was focused on something else. But I st but I didn't have like a core understanding of what the condition was, why it had happened, and I was 
terrified they would come back because what I what I would what I always thought was well if I um I might be able to get rid of this and I know that other people have gotten rid of this but like so what happens if if like two years down the line it comes back or six months down the line because because what it felt like to to me initially was that like it had just it had just like it was like it hit by lightning it was like it just it just it it just could happen again and maybe I'm maybe it's more likely to to, to happen again. But you're you're but you're you're absolutely right, Paul. It's a huge part of recovery is like is understanding that like this is it's the most common thing in the world in its in in, in its transient form. Like, but what, what I often say to people is like you know like seventy five percent of people. I think the, the the North American Association of Mental Illness like say that like seventy five percent of people will experience depersonalization, derealization at some point in their lives. Because it's a part, it's a natural part of your body and brain's response to stress and anxiety. It's so Absolutely. if you go through if you go through life without experiencing this, you are in a minority. <laughs> it's yeah. it's it's that it's that common. But um, the only reason it turned into a problem in the first place or into a chronic issue is because of focusing on it when it happened and catastrophizing that it meant that something terrible was wrong. That you were going crazy, right. that you were in a dream, that you that you had fried your brain or something, and not none, none of which have happened. But it's just a misunderstanding of it that causes it to turn into an ongoing issue. But when you do understand it, there's a one of my favorite phrases in in all of the anxiety research is anxiety is caused by the fear of anxiety, and in the yeah. same way, pa- panic attacks are caused by the fear of panic attacks, and depersonalization is caused by the fear of depersonalization, and part of recovery is understanding and internalizing that um, this, as frightening as it was, and, and, and at the start, especially at the beginning, it's, it's terrifying, but this is completely harmless. It's completely temporary. N- not only was this never going to hurt you, this is actually your body and brain's defensive mechanism. It's just happening at the wrong time. It's the mental equivalent of, of, a, of, a, of a fire alarm going off. It's like, you know, and, and as you say, like, you know, it's not something to be afraid of, and especially as you're once you let go of that catastrophic interpretation of it. And essentially, it's the same thing as somebody who um, experiences heart palpitations because they've had four cups of coffee, and then they catastrophize that I'm I'm having a heart attack and I'm going to die. And then if they but if they don't understand why that process happened and that catastrophic process happened they will then be terrified that, well, what if this happens in a week's time? What if I have another heart attack in, in a fortnight? What if I'm getting on, on, on the plane to my honeymoon and, I've a, and, and, that, and this happens again? It's out of my control. Part of recovery yes. is understanding that, no, this is within your control and depersonalization, derealization are, are the mental equivalent of heart palpitations and muscle tension. It is, it is an absolutely normal part of the human experience. Again, you're in a minority if you don't experience it. But you need yeah. we need to take the this catastrophic interpretation away from it as quickly as possible, which going back to what we were saying earlier is what that is what reducing that space between experiencing it and finding an explanation is, is hopefully doing over time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think there is something as well, actually, about um this certainly is kind of an anxiety and a stress condition. Because because the state of being in dissociation, the state of being in DPDR is is anxiety provoking for a lot of people. And um, but a lot of people do describe, I've got this disorder, but I don't feel anxious. So you'd saying to me, I've got an anxiety problem, but actually I don't feel anxious. Um and actually I work with a lot of people with a lot of um mental illnesses, particularly things like kind of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um we're actually feeling disconnected and feeling kind of indifferent or numb is a very common feature. But that isn't to say that that person, that individual isn't stressed. And actually the body can often seesaw between this experience of being kind of in a state of hyper arousal in this state of kind of hyperactivity and the heart rate going very hard and um, racing thoughts and feeling the butterflies in the stomach and the panic attacks. But also when the body is under a lot of stress and the mind is under a lot of stress, you can experience kind of hypo arousal where you kind of feel numb and disconnected and indifferent to things and, and listless in a sense of kind of malaise. So don't panic if, if 
even though we're just kind of describing this as a kind of anxiety kind of issue, um, don't panic if you're not actually feeling anxious because I didn't. I knew I wasn't. This wasn't anxiety in the usual sense. I wasn't feeling panic or butterflies in the stomach or my palms weren't sweaty and all the heart rate wasn't going like I remember years ago when I had kind of PTSD. Um, but you, when you are stressed, you can kind of flip the other way and you can feel kind of numb and, and disconnected um, from things. And that can sometimes happen with this disorder as well, is that, no, you're not experiencing kind of the sweaty palms and everything, and the heart rate going, but you are experiencing distress and that that can cause you to also become kind of numb and disconnected. And that doesn't mean that you're not feeling anxious. It's just your anxiety is presenting in a kind of different way. It kind of goes back as well to what we were saying earlier about like anxiety being a spectrum. You know, it's not it's not like uh, oh the the switch is on and you're supposed to have like racing thoughts. Um, uh, you're supposed to be sweating. Your muscles are supposed to be tense. Your heart's supposed to be beating more quickly. But hang on, my muscles are intense. Oh, something's wrong. You know, it's, oh, no, 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 it's not. Yeah. It's not that. Um, what it feels like is that you're playing whack-a-mole with different symptoms. So like, for, so for me, for example, I would have like three weeks of intense like visual symptoms. And then, and then for the next like six weeks, I would be obsessed with like my memory and think I'm, I'm developing dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that. And then after that, I'd have like, I'd have two weeks of like a specific existential thought about like the size of the universe or something, or maybe I'm in a dream and I, and, and I go that, 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 like, you know, and what it feels like is that it's like, well, first there's this, and then there's this, and then there's this, like, and it's, it's this obstacle course that I'm trying to, to get through. And there's just, and there's no end in sight. And sure. Sure. What's the next one going to be like, you know, but what I realized afterwards, and again, as, as I recovered is that, um, these, it, that it's not an obstacle course. It's, it's, it was me focusing on, on, my memory it was me then focusing on my vision and then me focusing on a specific thought it's my it's my focus on different aspects of the of the spectrum um that make it feel like it's this you know um an, an obstacle course that i have to get over one by one and part of recovery is realizing i don't need to address these one by one um i need to address the engine that's causing my focus to jump to them which is anxiety um, but again, moving away from this idea of like, this is a binary thing and your memory is damaged and your vision is damaged. And it's like, no, 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 this is, a, it's a lot, it's a lot more s- subtle than that. And the, and the, and the symptoms, both physical and mental can vary, uh, over time, but thankfully they all fade away, um, as your, as your recovery continues. Absolutely. Absolutely. W- one thing that's going back to kind of my professional work that I've kind of uh, been really kind of surprised by um, is I used to kind of work in drug and alcohol services for, for many years. Um, I was kind of, kind of had my initial career and you'd, you'd work with people who were taking a drug called ketamine. Um, so ketamine is, a, is a, a drug in which it induces a state of dissociation. So it's a dissociative drug. So I was kind of like, so there's people out there who are paying good money to to experience dissociation when I was absolutely terrified of experience dissociation. So, and they were willing to risk all kinds of side effects and dangerous effects. So I found that quite quite interesting. And the other one is I work with a lot of people who have um, a diagnosis of something called borderline personality disorder, um, of which one of the kind of criteria for the diagnosis is actually to experience dissociative symptoms. So I've kind of working with these people and asking them about the dissociation, expecting them to say, oh, this, this I get this derealization and it's really, really awful. I hate it. But actually, th- these individuals would often say, I, I like this experience. You know, I want to have this experience. And, and that's part of their kind of coping strategy to deal with their kind of, um, the, their other kind of difficulties with that, 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 this diagnosis. But it kind of really surprised me that these two kind of in individuals are going out of the way to experience what you and I were finding absolutely horrendous. And it kind of this kind of proved to me this idea that it's kind of all about how you appraise what's going on for you. That the 
people who are taking ketamine will say, well, this is a kind of really fun experience. I've paid for this. I want this to happen. And it'll just go once they've stopped taking the ketamine. Um, the same with the, the individuals with the, the diagnosis of borderline personality. They'll experience this kind of reaction to, to being overwhelmed, but they want to feel disconnected, which is kind of really in contrast to how um, people with this disorder um, kind of appraise what's going on for them, which is something they really don't want. It's something that's dangerous and something that's catastrophic and it's something they've got to get away from. So I just found that a useful sort of uh, insight to have to, to really show that it's about the appraisal. It's about how you assess what's going on for you. It's about how what your narrative is that kind of creates and um, decides whether this turns into a problem or not. I, was, I find it very interesting that, like, I mean, so the... I would say like the majority of especially young younger people who I speak to who developed DP and DR, um, it's also often through um, a bad uh, drug experience and and in particular weed. Which that was it's what happened for me as well back in the day. It was I had a horrendous experience after a joint in Amsterdam that was way stronger than I thought. Um, and it seems like the nature of weed is that like it's this lovely kind of dreamy. Uh, associative state it's um there's like rolling memory loss which is hysterically funny if you're trying to hold the conversation you know what, yeah. what are we talking about there again like you know I, um music sounds great um food tastes great cartoons are amazing pixar movies are amazing um except if you start to feel uncomfortable and then all that Absolutely, stuff yeah all that stuff I just mentioned is really, really, really scary. And then, okay, how long is this going to last? Have people ever got so high that they, that they haven't come down? And then it can become like almost like brutally introspective. And it's just like being on a roller coaster of kind of concepts and ideas and visuals. And you can't, there's no purchase. You can't grab onto anything and you're just racing through it. And it's very, very frightening. And, and also, and because like the, the panic attack that, that, that can, that that can trigger um, if you have a feeling, feelings of dissociation as part of a panic attack that are happening in the context of feeling dissociated because you're on weed, it can then feel yeah, like it's going to exacerbate yeah, it, that. It, 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 it exactly, it's all more into the into the whirlpool, like you know. Um, yeah. Interestingly, about ketamine, um, if you ke even ke ketamine is is more of a directly dissociative drug. Um, in that it's you know it's an it's it's an anesthetic um, as well. But um, uh, Terence McKenna once said about ketamine um, something like the the interesting thing about ketamine is that once you take ketamine, <laughs> you you cease to care about the fact that you've taken ketamine. So it becomes like it's it's a much less kind of um, not that it's not introspective, but it's like you. It's it's much less likely to cause like panicky kind of symptoms yes. that are the the panicky sensations that that that, that we can cause, um, which I think is why like is why why ketamine and and MDMA as well are the the drugs being kind of more used kind of toward in in, in therapy regarding d depression and things like that. But ketamine is often kind of spoken about as like a kind of it's a it's a tool of kind of like re resetting yourself to re resetting the, your your thought patterns to some degree. Um, Whereas weed can tend to be a more kind of it, it 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 stays within the narrative of your of your reality, but it just kind of augments it. Whereas weed is aren't that weed with ketamine. Um, is you you you're not concerned like that you've taken a drug and that it's going wrong. You're just kind of like in the in the flow of enjoying yeah. what you're. I think you're, you're probably right, and that's why we probably don't see it as as much in the kind of presentations of um of people who develop this disorder chronically and nevertheless you can imagine a individual having a, an episode of um dissociation on ketamine and just putting in a narrative well this this has changed my brain <laughs> you know so it doesn't really matter what the, the the drug could be coffee or the drug could be whatever paracetamol you know if you stick a narrative in it that oh this has done something to my brain and i can't change it back or this is this is creating something permanent or done something special to me um it matters not the drug what matters is you had experience of dpd or whatever the cause and you've inserted a your own narrative in it uh which is a catastrophic narrative 
So the, the weed's changed my brain, the ketamine's changed my brain, or I'm meant to be having this experience on ketamine, but I'm having this experience on ketamine, and that's a, a dreadful thing. Um, so it's all about this kind of this 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 um, narrative and a catastrophic narrative, and that's why people develop um, the disorder of DPDR. Absolutely, and it's it, it, it's it's something that I, I say to people um, all, all the time is that the, the 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 drug itself doesn't it doesn't really matter um, because it's not it's like what I what I said if someone had if someone's had a bad time on weed develop anxiety and dp and dr and like and i and i and i familiar I, did, I went through this i was like oh, i fried my brain with drugs like you know but what i say to people now is that look so look if you had taken if you had taken like five times the amount of weeds that you had taken that night or whatever and you had had a good time and you hadn't had a panic attack we probably wouldn't be having this conversation um and also i i speak to people all the time who have developed anxiety and DP and DR who have never touched a drug in their lives. Maybe they, they may not even drink, but they're walking through the supermarket one day and they had a panic attack. It just hit them. Maybe there was, they were going through some different stresses in their lives. And so, and you know, the scariest thing about a panic attack is that it appears to have no cause. You're not getting chased by a grizzly bear. You're, you're in, you're in Tesco's getting the shopping and then bang, that, that's the scary, the scariest thing about it. But the people who experience who develop it without drugs, their their experience of it is exactly the same as the person who experienced it from who developed it. Yeah. The, 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 the symptoms are not different. They're different from person to person, of course, but there's but the, but there's no uh, kind of yeah. symptomatic. There's no correlation between the cause of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's the yeah. the key the key thing is it's the panic attack. It's the it's the um the aggregation of stresses over time that have led your body to think, uh oh, we need to to get to 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 uh to go to DEFCON one, you know, and even though there's yeah. no that there, there there's no danger around. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean the, the, it might even be that somebody's just tired and that creates a symptom. Or the, like you said about the person perhaps going on a flight to Australia and getting jet lagged. If they assess, and they have experience of DPDR as a result of that, if they assess that as something terrible, that then sets up the cycle of, um, of, of, of more anxiety, creating more DP, creating more um, catastrophic thinking, creating more uh, anxiety. It is pure that the, the reason why this turns into a disorder is this loop that people get into is because of the catastrophic assessment of what's going on for them. The cause matters not. The cause could be, like you said, weeds. It could be fatigue. It could be that they're, they're anxious, or there's a lot going on in the life, or it could just come out of the blue for no reason. Um, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. It's just how the person appraises that. If they appraise it as something catastrophic, then they set up the loop. And going back to something you mentioned earlier as well, Paul, and this is like I'm, I meant to, to to say this, but like dissociation itself, the, the feeling of of like being disconnected is. It's not it's it's not inherently unpleasant. Like this is what I mean. I um, meditate. I med I meditate each day. Like you know, and other days where I mean, a, a successful meditation is when I'm not really thinking of anything, and there's maybe a slight sense of disconnection. But it's not it's not it, it, that in and of itself is not is not something to be afraid of. Again, as as you just mentioned, if someone someone flies to Australia. And they get off, get off the plane, and they're walking around getting their bags, and they feel a sense of disconnection. It's that's not not something to be worried about. It's actually, and and if and if it's something that you associate with travel and with going to see your kids on the other side of the world, it might actually be nice. It's a nice thing that you associate with. As yeah. as you said, it's it's just your appraisal of that experience that makes us positive or negative. Or potentially catastrophic, you know. But yeah, that's all. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, because yeah. I, like I said to you, I, I still experience the symptom. I'm in recover. I've, I've recovered uh, because this thing doesn't affect me anymore. But it's not to say I don't experience episodes of DPDR because I do because I'm a human. I mean, it's often when I'm stressed, and I would simply say to myself, "This is just my body's way of showing me that I'm feeling a bit stressed and overwhelmed right now." That is the narrative I I, I put on that. Um, and, and actually, then it becomes actually quite a useful tool because I might not be realizing I'm stressed or, or anxious or worked about something, but my body's telling me I'm with this, this symptom. So then I can do something about the stress or I can 
you know, maybe I need to rest more, or maybe I need to take up less work on with me or whatever. Um, so it's actually rather than it being something um, problematic or getting in the way of life, t- to me, it's actually something helpful because it's a useful tool my body is giving me to say, you're feeling overwhelmed, you're feeling stressed, do something about that. I mean, if, I, if I'm like working really hard and, and I'm not sleeping properly, not going to the gym, not meditating, if I'm drinking industrial amounts of coffee, which I tend, tend to do sometimes, um, what will happen over the course of a couple of days is I'll get worn out, I'll get burnt out, um, and I might feel very, very, this very, very lo- low levels of, of uh, uh, DPDR. In the same way that physically, I might, my heart might be beating more quickly, my muscles yep. might be tense, I might, have a, I might have a tension headache. But if that ever happens, I can point to it and say, ah, okay, right, I'm under way too much stress at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to decaf. I'm going to go for a jog this evening. Um, I'm going to go to bed early tonight. Uh, no screen time for an hour before bed. I'm going to get up early in the morning, go for a swim, do whatever. And the thing is, is that like when you interpret it like that, which is the correct interpretation, because it is just your body and brain saying, okay, you're under too much stress. Like the the difference is that if that ever happens now, and it's a perfectly natural thing, you look at it and you say, it's my body telling me that I need to to, to slow down, as opposed to when it happened in 2005, and I pointed it and said, I'm going crazy, I'm in a dream, um, I'm going to die. And yes. and then it, it turning into a, a feedback loop. So one of the one of the wonderful things about going through any anxiety based condition is that you have that experience under your belt, and that you can and you recognize it, and you and you can look at it and say, oh wow, okay, geez, I actually, yeah, I I actually haven't been sleeping right at all. Okay, so I need to I need to address that. But looking at it from a practical point of view, as opposed to catastrophizing that you're that you're um dam- damage your brain forever with drugs like you know well yeah i mean the, the the thing is there is that you know we're not when we experience i think you say you get you do a lot of stress or whatever drink too much coffee or whatever all right i'm i'm, I'm under stress of work and i experience um depersonalization and um, my the instinct might be to say well i need to try and address the depersonalization well, that's the incorrect thing to say because that puts a focus on the depersonalization then and then I'm constantly looking out for it and searching books about what to do for it or whatever. I, actually, uh, it, it's a flag for me to what's causing the depersonalization. It's that I'm stressed at work, so I need to reduce my stress at work. All right, you, for you, are you drinking too much coffee? So it, it, it's not focusing on the, the DPDR, focusing on why the DPR, DPR might be present. Um and tackling that rather than trying to tackle the DPDR. So, Paul, so you're back, back, back to work. You're you've been recovered for what, a decade now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So it's um, uh, it's really, it's um, it's great that like someone like yourself who's gone through this is is working in the in the health system and is you know, not only are you kind of primed to to spot these symptoms in in other people, but to be able to to offer help and to to because I mean b- back in the day when this when this happened to me, I mean I would have I would have given the world to to just be able to speak to somebody who just was who could sit me down and say no no I know what you're going through this is why this is happening that crazy existential thought that you're having having that's why this is happening I had that too to yes. to 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 just have that kind of just to be able to to, to share something with somebody. Have them just and had them just like t- take the boxes with you and say, yeah, no, it's okay. I know, I know it's scary, but it's okay. It's it's normal, it's natural, and, and, and it's harmless. So it's 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 a great thing that you're that you're um, following the pres- profession that you're doing. Yeah, when the statistics would say I'm probably not the only one, so there must be other mental health nurses out there who are, <laughs> who also have been through uh, through this too. Um, Paul for uh you know there would be people watching the channel who might be going through um dp and dr who might be in kind of the same situation that you were back in um back in 2007 um what, what advice would you have for uh for 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 people going through dp dr um i would say believe that recovery is possible um 
And I, th- I think, broadly speaking, I would say look, look to see if there's lots of stress going on in your life. And, and if there is, then, then that probably needs to be re- re- reduced as best uh, as you can. And, and probably to try and find an activity that's really kind of going to draw uh, your attention away from yourself. Um, for me, again, that was exercise, but for you, it might be something completely different. Um, that, that's kind of how I got better. But equally, there's more than one way to string a cat, as we say. Um, so there's plenty of routes to, to to recovery that don't necessarily involve the um, the same route that I took, as you obviously are seeing on them um, on these in these um, YouTube videos with the, uh, with the with the people you're speaking to. Well, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you today. Um, it's been particularly fascinating for me to speak to somebody who went through this around the same time that I did, um, uh, at a time when there was even, well, that there was very, very little information available on, online about it. But I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that you recovered. I'm thrilled that, um, you've, and that, that you can take your experience into, into work and that you've been gracious enough to, to share your experience and insight with us um, on the channel today. So uh, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure. And to you, Sean, thank you very much.